Hi, this is Outlaw Bookseller and today I'm going to talk about fantasy and the phenomenon that I call the artificiality of fantasy writing. I'm specifically referring to the sword and sorcery novel from 1977 onwards. Now, when you use a term like fantasy, it's very, very broad. Fantasy means unrealistic non-mimetic fiction that is not science fiction. You could say that science fiction is fantastic, that if you want to look at fiction as being split into realism and the fantastic, that science fiction may well go into the fantastic. I personally think it's in between. But if you want to talk about fantasy, the predominant subgenre or mode of fantasy that most people think of when we use the term fantasy in the literary sense is what I call sword and sorcery. Now there's going to be some background on this so bear with me but fantasy writing in the commercial sense that we think of Lord of the Rings, we think of a Game of Thrones, we think of all these things which have recently been televised like The Witcher and um, we think of things like The Wheel of Time, all that sort of stuff. Books which have been popular for many many years. Well the interesting thing is is that people I think have a distorted view of those sort of books um, because of commercial reasons. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. So if we want to go back to the beginning of that element of fantasy writing. If you look in the Encyclopedia of Fantasy by Clute and Grant, which is an amazing reference book, which I've had for many years since it was first published, they cite possibly Alexander Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers, as being the sort of primary source of the sword part of sword and sorcery. Because of course, what we get in that sort of fantasy writing is we get certain symbols, certain tropes that come up time and time again. Swordsmen or women as heroes or anti-heroes. We have wizardry and wild romance, to coin the title of the book by Michael Moorcock. Quests, unusual lands, what have you. They do follow a certain template. Now, I would say that template goes all the way back much further than Dumas to some of the founding myths of Western Europe. The Norse myths, when the Norse myths were first written down by Snorri Sturluson in the 11th century in Iceland as the Prose Edda. They go back to things like Beowulf, which of course is the great English poem, which is partially set in Denmark. And there are characters from Scandinavia. There are named swords, there are dragons, there are monsters, there are quests. So there's all these things. So it does go right the way back into so the oral tradition of northwestern Europe. So there's that as well and that obviously filtered through into storytelling and eventually into prose fiction, hence Dumas. Now by the end of the 19th century there was quite a revival of interest in the Nordic and in that sort of thing and William Morris, the designer, um, that genius um, who wrote um, a science fiction novel um, called News From Nowhere, which is a utopian novel. He was a socialist. He could design, he could paint, he could draw. Absolutely fantastic, um, amazing talented guy. He wrote several novels of a Nordic sword and sorcery type. Um, and it was very much a thing to try and return to the standards of writing that you got in the chivalric era, Arthurian sort of things. So that was there as well. And then round about 1912, a popular pop writer called Edgar Rice Burroughs came along and in about a year he wrote Tarzan of the Apes, The Land That Time Forgot and um, another book called A Princess of Mars. And Princess of Mars um, is about a confederate soldier who's transported, it's not entirely clear how, maybe magically to Mars where he meets all sorts of alien creatures and he gets involved in swordplay and what have you. So these things were all there bubbling away in the background. And then round about 1930, um, a young writer called Robert E. Howard, who was only active as a writer for about 10 years, he committed suicide at the age of 30. He was one of the great pop writers who wrote for Weird Tales, lots of pop magazines in the 20s and 30s. I think it was 1936 he died, uh, maybe a bit earlier. And he created Conan the Barbarian. 
He also created some other characters rather like that, like Solomon Cain and Brack McMahon. Um, but Conan is the one that we remember and who has pop been popularized in comics by Marvel in the 70s and in 80s cinema with old Arnie Schwarzenberger um, as um, the thief, the reaver, the slayer, Conan. And it was pretty much Howard that put sword and sorcery on the map. Round about the same time, people like um, C.L. Moore, Catherine L. Moore, was also writing for Weird Tales and she created a female sword and sorcery heroine called Jirelle of Joery, who lives in a kind of alternate medieval France. A bit later on, Lee Brackett, another great early female SF and fantasy writer, um, did a series of stories which are collectively known as Sea Kings of Mars, and they are very, very much in the Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter, Princess of Mars type vein. So sword and sorcery was happening, and then late 30s, early 40s, you started to see stories appearing by a really, really great writer and actor called Fritz Lieber. Um, I've got some of them here, and this is one of Fritz Lieber's books. And he had two characters called Fafard and the Grey Mouser. And Fafard is a really tall sort of guy um, with ginger hair, auburn, and you know, he was um, a bit like Conan. And the Grey Mouser was small, fleet, and he was a thief. And they're sort of very roguish characters. They're very elegantly written and they were fixed up um, into sort of not into what look like novels. They're actually collections of short stories much, much later. And Fritz did those from um, the sort of early 40s onwards. Funnily enough, he was he acted in um, the um, 1943 Universal Pictures remake of Phantom of the Opera, the colour one with Claude Rains. You actually see him in that because he was a tall Shakespearean actor and um, very talented man. He's revered amongst fans of science fiction and fantasy writing from the old school. So that was already there. Now, of course, for most people, when they think about fantasy writing and they think of swords, sorcery, wizards, quests, they immediately think of J.R.R. Tolkien, which is entirely understandable. Now, Tolkien's first um, book, The Hobbit, was published about 1937 by Unwin in the UK. And it was kind of immediately hailed as a children's classic and it sort of became established and worked its way along. And of course, Tolkien was an academic at Oxford University and he specialised in Old English, Icelandic, the Norse myths, that sort of thing. And he became professor um, at Oxford due to some work he did on Beowulf. And he, wrote, he did a translation of Beowulf um, and he did some critical work on that. And that's the basis of his sort of academic achievement. And now you can get a really nice edition of Beowulf um, with Tolkien's version of it and all his notes. And it's really, really interesting. It's a great one to get. So Tolkien was there. <clears throat> but of course, this was long before Lord of the Rings. So while people like Edgar Rice Burroughs, Lee Brackett, C.L. Moore, and most of all, Robert E. Howard and Fritz Lieber were creating the sword and sorcery genre of, of fantasy. Um, Tolkien was there doing his academic work. He was creating Middle-earth based on Midgard from the Norse myths in his spare time, having a great time with that. And of course he left a garage full of papers, which is why the History of Middle-earth series that's been published over the last 30 years is about 12 volumes. And um, so he was doing that. So Tolkien wasn't the originator. He was one of a number of people working on adapting the style of earlier chivalric fiction, of Nordic fiction, and creating something more popular out of it. Except, of course, Tolkien wasn't a populist. He wasn't having things published in pulp magazines like the others were. Because then, that's how most genre fiction was published. It wasn't published in book form. It was published as short stories or serials in magazines. And that carried on way up into the 50s. So, the sword and sorcery subgenre, what most people think of when we hear the word fantasy, was well established by the early 40s. And I've got some of my fantasy novels here and I want to pick out a few favourites. I've mentioned one or two of these before in other videos and um, one I'm really keen on is The Broken Sword by Paul Anderson, which dates back to about 53, 54. Um, and I've got Fritz Lieber's works here. You'll also see I've got some George R. R. Martin. Um, Michael Moorcock is a big favourite of mine. I've done several videos about Mike's books and collecting them. And this is um, The Dreaming City, which is the first Elric novel. Not the first one to be written, but the first one in the sequence. And this is the abridged version. The full version is called Elric of Melnibene, but it's a really nice lance of paperback with a psychedelic colour. So I thought I'd show you that. Um, so if Elric fans, if you see this, pick it up because it's uncommon and it is slightly different to 
the more familiar versions published in the UK. Michael Moorcock was really big in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s as probably the most important British sword and sorcery writer who's ever lived. There's, there's no question about it, he is and he still is despite the fact that he's become a more obscure figure in the last sort of, 20 years because the way his publishing has been handled and also um, you know there's lots of other people another one of my favorite sort of um, sword and sorcery writers is the very elegant Michael Shear and this is Nif the Lean and this is really beautifully written stuff and somebody else who you know came on board quite early with that sort of thing around about 1950 is a writer called Jack Vance and this is um, Rialto the Marvelous the fourth book in his Tales of the Dying Earth sequence and the first one is called The Dying Earth um, the original title was Marizan the Magician and it's comprised of linked short stories that were published initially in magazines and in book form later on. So by 1950, Howard was gone, Vance, Anderson, Lieber and other people like Fletcher Pratt, Inspired to Camp, these people, they were sort of writing sword and sorcery as we know it today. Um, so it wasn't something that Tolkien invented. Now, The Fellowship of the Rings came out in 53, 50, 54, the same time as Poole Anderson's Broken Sword. And of course, what's interesting is because Lord of the Rings is a really big book um, and it was so big that the publishers at the time and when decided that they couldn't really publish a book that large and market it effectively. Also because of binding technology, it would have to have really thin paper like a Bible. So they decided to go with three volumes. So this is really important. Lord of the Rings isn't a trilogy. It is one book split into three volumes so it's not a trilogy in the true sense a trilogy in the true sense is three separate is three separate novels that have a connection ongoing character situations what have you now even though there was um critical acclaim immediately for that the fact is is that lord of the rings didn't become a bestseller until the 1960s when we had a lot of social changes particularly in america and britain and especially in america with civil rights um, the use of psychedelic drugs, the Vietnam War, the Kennedy assassination, all these things were tied into the way that the beat generation influenced young people who were tired of the way things had been, the baby boomers, and the hippies were born. And the hippies had a rather pantheistic worldview. They were into all sorts of things that don't appear to be connected, and very often they weren't. And they were big fans of science fiction and fantasy writing, and um, they were big fans of Dune, and also Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. Um, and also Lord of the Rings. So Lord of the Rings became really popular on American campuses, particularly in the mid 1960s, some 10 years after, you know, Anwin finished issuing the three volumes. So Tolkien got really popular then. Now in the USA, the books hadn't been copyrighted properly. So there were loads of pirate editions. And I think it was the Fantasy Society of America or the, or the, or the Science Fiction Writers of America um, got together and they managed to get that sorted out and make sure that Tolkien got his money. Because of course, you know, it's, it's really not on. I mean, the age of book piracy was the sort of 18th to 19th century. There was a lot of that. And the 20th, 20th, 20th century, that just wouldn't do. And there was international copyright laws. So they got it copyrighted properly and Tolkien got his money, which was the way it should be. And, you know, by the early 70s, um, you know, it was like absolutely huge. Now, throughout all this time, people like Vance, Lieber, Anderson, Moorcock um, were popular. They were still publishing stories in magazines. Their stories were getting fixed up into books and published in hardcover and paperback. Um, but still, sword and sorcery was quite a small thing. Now, I remember being in school my last year in junior school, we had a, a student teacher um, who was a sort of young, sort of hippie lady, and to me, obviously, I was about 10 or 11, and um, you know, she seemed very sophisticated. And we did a thing for the week or so she was with us where she read us parts of The Hobbit. And each table, you know, the way you kids, you, know, you, have, you, you don't have separate desks, you have a table pulled together, you used to in my day. And um, she named different tables there was the Hobbit's table, and there was the um, the sort of goblins table, um, there was the elves table and so on, that sort of stuff. And it did make a massive impact on me because I was al I'd already read things which are more sophisticated in my view, things like John Wyndham and HG Wells and, and stuff like that. But it was interesting and that's what led me to first discover Tolkien and The Hobbit's great, great fun book, obviously. Um, but of course, Tolkien's name was in everybody's lips and he was really popular. And when I was in school, 
loads of my friends as I got a bit older had read Lord of the Rings but I was more interested in you know they were interested in Lord of the Rings and photochromic sunglasses and later on Fleetwood Mac I was more about Philip K. Dick leather jackets and um, you know and punk rock um, but I didn't really read fantasy writing I was reading reading SF and I didn't really discover fantasy writing properly until the early 80s now in the <clears throat> late 70s you know, publishing wasn't as rapacious and commercial and clued up now as it was then. So if you go back then, what's interesting is there weren't loads of people imitating Tolkien and jumping on the bandwagon. There was just the writers who were writing fantasy. And most of the writers who came on board to write fantasy were more inspired by Robert E. Howard and by people like Lieber and Vance and you. And they were all still active, as I say. So Tolkien was the outsider. He was unusual. And of course, when you read Tolkien, you know, there's two camps on this. I personally think Tolkien's really overrated. There's a lot of world building. Um, you know, the books go on and on and on. The characters seem more like archetypes than characters. Um, it's a bit twee at times. One of the most interesting things I think in Lord of the Rings is the fact that you never see Sauron and you never hear his voice. He's never described. And that gives him sort of mystery, which is really interesting. But it's also a bit of a weakness in a way in that I don't think Tolkien could write those sort of characters, whereas somebody like Michael Moorcock or Poole Anderson, they could write demonic characters. And in Moorcock's books, particularly in the Elric books, there's Ariok, the Duke of Hell, the Knight of the Swords. Um, and you know, and he's very pretty scary. So I don't think Tolkien could do that. He saw things more in sort of black and white. Whereas I think um, the American school that came from Robert E. Howard was more amoral. I mean, Conan, you know, wasn't a good guy. He was a bad guy. He did lots of bad things. He was a thief, a slayer, a reaver. But you know, he also sort of fought back against sort of black hearted wizards and monsters and what have you. So there was that always well, there. It was always more realistic. The sort of pop heroes are more anti-heroic. And Tolkien was, was less like that. He was more sort of Lily White. So the combination of the world building and the Lily White thing didn't really work for me and, and still doesn't. So, but obviously a lot of people love it. You know, they're hugely popular, obviously. But interestingly, as I said, the publishing at that time, there wasn't a lot of bandwagon jumping in the same way. Then in the late 70s, um, a science fiction writer called Lester Del Rey, who'd been a science fiction writer since the late 30s, um, he had a publishing imprint called Del Rey Books. Um, and he had come across a writer called Terry Brooks. And he commissioned Brooks um, to write a trilogy. And the trilogy is called Shannara. And the first one's called The Sword of Shannara. And it's very similar to Lord of the Rings, um, except that it's set um, in a post-nuclear apocalypse world where the radiation has created elves, gnomes, magic and what have you. So it's quite interesting sort of thing, um, but not my sort of thing at all. And um, Delray did a lot of work editing with Brooks on that. And Brooks is still writing today and hugely sort of successful and popular. And when um, The Sword of Shannara, the first volume, was published, I think they printed 50,000 hardcovers and it went to number one in the New York Times bestseller charts. And that was the beginning of the modern fantasy boom, the modern sword and sorcery boom. And it was hugely influenced by Tolkien. Soon after that, we had Stephen Donaldson, the Stephen Donaldson books, Thomas Covenant. Um, there were two initial trilogies, one later on. They were also really popular and there were obvious deaths to Tolkien, despite the fact there were some very dark things in them. Um, that came out of um, Donaldson's own background and you know but they were still Tolkien-esque there was an alternate world the land um, there was Lord Fowl who was a bit like Sauron and all those sort of things and the sort of three volume sort of thing which Tolkien did where you have set up quest and resolution in three volumes became the dominant mode in the years that followed um, when I entered book selling in late 1984 David Eddings and Raymond E. Feast had come along. There were other people as well. They were the sort of next wave. Brooks and Donaldson were still popular, but they kind of peaked. Um, and they came along, they were really popular. And by that point, I was really into Michael Moorcock and I was reading people like Fritz Lieber. And it was interesting because at that point, um, if you had a bay of books, and if you look behind me on my shelves, you a bay or a drop, some people call it, is about seven shelves in a bookshop. Um, you know, you, you couldn't fill one of those with fantasy novels. They weren't enough published in the UK to do that. And it was interesting because over the couple of years after that, 
it was easy for me to actually get a fantasy section together because publishers started commissioning books, buying books, and all of a sudden there were talking ripoffs everywhere. Some were very good, some were indifferent, some did have original elements, some didn't. But the point was, was all of a sudden everything in sword and sorcery writing, in fantasy writing, was a trilogy or a series that went on and on and on. Because of course with Tolkien there wasn't just Lord of the Rings, there was the Silmarillion and there was this garage full of papers, there was all the short stories. So the whole world building thing of having, you know, you'd have one author and you know, you'd fill shelves with their book became the way fantasy went. And of course, as if I, if I show you again, just to show you, um, this is Michael Moorcock's The Sleeping Sorceress. Look how slim that is. And Moorcock's novels were all like that, pretty thin. Um, because they were mostly short stories fixed up. Same with Fritz Lieber, Jack Vance. I mean, it wasn't until the mid to late eighties that you could even get a singleton like this by Michael Shears and Um, you know, and that's a singleton. Um, there is a sequel, but it wasn't planned as a series and never became a trilogy. So it was very much one of those things, the books ballooned. So they were imitating Tolkien. So you could say Tolkien invented a new style. You sometimes get that referred to as high fantasy um, or as epic fantasy, but it is all basically sword and sorcery, but it's not amoral, anti-heroic sword and sorcery. It's a different thing. However, it is artificial. Stephen Donaldson once wrote a diptych, a two volume series, um, but the way it's gone is that now it is impossible for anybody to write and publish a singleton a standalone, as people say. Singleton, of course, is the correct term rather than conflated with. So it's impossible for anybody to do a singleton in fantasy. So you have this artificially created endless series of trilogies, which then get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's an interesting phenomenon. People lap them up. And of course, fantasy, you know, you'd think that it was about the imagination and the original, but it turns out to be that what people actually like in this is more of the same. So it's not really very imaginative or fantastic at all. It's, it's just familiar symbols, familiar tropes, familiar structures, what have you. And okay, you can work within a tradition, you can be a craftsperson, and you can say, I'm a craftsman, I'm going to work within this tradition, I'm going to see what I can do with these symbols, these tropes, these ideas, and we go from there. Um, but of course the history is lost, and writers have their time, they pass on, new writers come along, um, and these books are predominantly read by young people. Michael Moorcock once said, I generally write for the 16 year old reader I once was, because he's written lots of other things as well, but he did say that. And it's quite interesting. So now, you know, we've had pretty much 40 years of Tolkien ripoffs. More recently, since the success of George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, which has brought the hard and the fast and the amoral back into fantasy writing because of course George is older and he read people like Roger Zelazny, he would have read Moorcock, he read all this stuff, he wasn't a huge Tolkien fan. You know, we ended up with um, the wonderful, he was a great writer anyway, he was always a good writer, it's just that nobody read his books apart from the few of us. Um, you ended up with the Game of Thrones on TV and the series and of course because the series has moved quickly and George has had sort of several sort of writer's blocks and what have you. It's sort of run out of steam and it kind of shows the kind of pointlessness because when you read these, my view very much is the first three are fantastic and I really loved them and I thought the structure was good, the characters were good, popular fiction but really well written popular fiction. And then by the time you get to um, Feast for Crows, which is I don't have here, um, he's just moving characters around like pawns on a chessboard and the huge problem of commercial artificial fantasy series you know then comes up it's treading water it's the same thing and i personally you know usually um the setting up of a series is enough for me the, the quest and everything i could do without um so you know my favorite of these the first one what i love about this is the structure and at the end um this it could have ended for me I, I didn't need any sequels you know, I like the other ones but if he'd just written that one that would have been perfect and that's what's missing in fantasy writing today nobody can do a single turn and commercially nobody's allowed to do one try and think of a singleton sword and sorcery novel published in the last 30 years and you'll come up with hardly any in the last 10 15 years probably none I think there's been one so 
have a look at that. So it's a problem because, of course, when publishers do this, if volume one doesn't take off or people buy it and they don't like it, so they don't buy volume two, it kind of kills a writer's career. So, you know, it's a difficult thing and it's been spreading over into SF and it's not healthy. It's not a healthy thing at all. So readers, people say to me, oh, you know, they're not as good as they were. And I always say, well, stop buying them. Try something else. So readers, if you're bored with this sort of thing, stop buying it. Of course, a lot of people won't be bored and they'll carry on. So that's it. But what I would say is that if you do like fantasy and you are stuck on, you know, the craft of the sword, the wizard, the quest, what have you, try something older, something more fleeter, more sharp, um, more interesting. I mean, if you read a book like The Broken Sword, for example, it's over in about 150 pages and it's got all the elements um, and people like Anderson, Vance, Lieber, Moorcock, Michael Shear, you know, they're great writers, real craftsmen, beautiful language that recalls the beautiful language of the Nordic sagas, of Beowulf, um, of chivalric um, literature. You know, it's, it's the real thing. So for me, um, you know, the artificiality of the fantasy trilogy is a big problem for writers. So that's just some thoughts on that. Um, I'm only saying this because I, I am back into reading sort of the classic old school fantasy again. And it is, I am sort of quite frustrated with the way that the publishing money has increasingly gone from science fiction singletons over to fantasy series. And as I say, it's infecting science fiction now as well. So there are more and more series. And is that really what imaginative writing is about? More of the same? I'll leave you with that thought. This is Outlaw Bookseller signing out.